Donald Trump's Federal Reserve pick wants to put metal chips inside every single dollar bill so they can track it and tax it. There's a lot happening in the market. There's even more happening in the news. Let's discuss. Hey everybody, I'm Gary Palmer Jr., you're you, and together we are Minting Coins, your trusted source for crypto news, interviews, and ICO reviews. Thank you for showing up. Hit that like button. It really supports us, and it helps other people find this content. Also, if you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comments box below so your voice is heard as part of the community. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Donald Trump's Federal Reserve pick that he is nominated to lead the Federal Reserve System inside the United States. The organization, the centralized organization that is making the decisions about the interest rates and about the how much new money gets printed in the world, uh, controlling the dollar and really creating disadvantage for a lot of people. The person that he's picked to lead this, uh, this organization is very Keynesian, very pro-central bank, and uh, also pro-tracking all the dollars in the world with metal chips, putting metal chips in uh, all the Benjamins, the $1 bills, all the dollar bills, so that they can help control taxes, tax people more on the transactions that are happening. But also what this really gets us down the road to of creating a world where they can control negative interest rates inside a country like America. Negative interest rates where it's gonna cost you money to leave your money in a bank. They want you to uh, cycle that money. They don't want you to hoard any cash. And the bottom line is that negative interest rates are scary and create hard times for people around the world. So there's a lot to go over. So with that being said, let's take a look at the market, take a peek at the news, and let's discuss. So starting with a quick market recap over at livecoinwatch.com, we see Bitcoin is hovering around that $10,500 mark. It has the current Bitcoin dominance uh, has been increasing. Currently 39, almost 40% of the 449 billion dollar total market capitalization. Uh, so we saw it getting pretty low. We, now we see it increasing again. And uh, because this is a market, it goes up, it goes down, it can go much higher, it could go much lower, or it could stay the same, we don't know. What we do know is that uh, in the past 24 hours, we've seen Omizi Go jump because Omizi Go has uh, released some exciting news about their open source SDK. And uh, also I wanna let you guys know all the Ethereum Classic holders out there that there's gonna be an Ethereum Classic airdrop hard fork, depending on how you think about it, and it's gonna be benefiting everyone that's holding the Ethereum Classic tokens. We're gonna to talk about that more in a second here. So real quick from June at Omizi and Omizi Go that they have released the Omizi Go white label SDK. It's now open, it's now open source, and it's out there and available for people to access and for people to use. And this is very, very exciting because Omizi Go can provide interoperability for any digital asset. And the Omizigo network is gonna achieve scalability through Plasma, and that's gonna be secured through Ethereum. And so this is very, very exciting for the Ethereum network. This is very exciting for uh, the interoperability of anyone being able to exchange any token for any other token using the Omizigo platform, using this white label wallet. It's gonna be really interesting to see which big companies move forward with this technology and which uh, smaller developers build on top of it and how this affects the price overall. I think on top of that, a lot of people are gonna be expecting to see the proof of stake and uh, the proof of stake system with the Omizigo OMG tokens and uh, how that's going to provide additional fees uh, and income for the holders of those tokens based on the work that they're doing to provide those nodes for the system. In terms of the Ethereum Classic slash Callisto project, a uh, quick summary for you that they're saying that this isn't a hard fork, it's an airdrop. Uh, the difference is that there's not going to be a shared history. Both chains are going to continue to exist. And those holding Ethereum Classic at block 5.5 million, which is going to happen around March 5th in uh, less than a week here, they're going to receive an equivalent amount of CLO tokens. And so if you want your CLO tokens, the safest bet is going to be to store your Ethereum Classic in a wallet 
not on an exchange. Mobile wallets like Jax are unknown. People say that the best way is a wallet where you're going to be able to control your private keys. A lot of confusion around this because people aren't ever exactly sure what to do. There's a lot of people in the message boards here. If you have any questions, then jump in the Reddit, jump into message boards. I'll also include this link in the show notes below for the Callisto Network announcement, including the white paper, technical details, and a, a lot of uh, additional FAQs for you. It looks like here, my Ether wallet will be a great place to help you uh, with storing your Ethereum Classic. If you understand how to use my Ether wallet or the new Mr. Crypto and connect it to the Ethereum Classic blockchain, because you could use my Ether wallet for Ethereum or Ethereum Classic, you just have to change the settings. But the Callisto Network is really interesting. Essentially, they're developing a second layer on top of Ethereum Classic. So Ethereum Classic is going to act as a store of value because there's never going to be more than about 220, 230 of the ETC tokens. Ethereum regular ETH is sort of uh, infinite. They're, they're, they can create an infinite amount of new Ethereum, even though the rate of new Ethereum may be practically zero. It's still isn't zero. With Ethereum Classic, the inflation is going to be zero, which actually makes Ethereum Classic deflationary. And on top of the Ethereum Classic blockchain, uh, which has miners and has this limitation in tokens, they're going to be putting the Callisto network on top of that to run proof of stake and to really test and expand the network in all sorts of interesting ways. I think it's important to keep in mind that even the Bitcoin blockchain is still a beta. A lot of people are putting all of their faith and credit into Bitcoin, and we need to recognize that Bitcoin is not at its full release. It's version zero point something, not one point something. And uh, the, the developers are still testing it. The developers are still working on it. And anyone who's purchasing any token in the space is doing so at huge speculation. With that being said, with great risk comes great reward. And it seems as if the diversification holding a little bit of each of these tokens provides interesting value propositions moving forward as we see more and more of the existing bigger blockchains getting forked. Uh, you can have one Bitcoin or some amount of Bitcoin and every fork of that token is going to just be connected with those original private keys, assuming you have access to your private keys. A lot of interesting dynamics in the space. Let me know what you think in the show notes below. So this brings us to the news from this article from the freethoughtproject.com where Trump's Federal Reserve pick wants to put metal chips in cash to track every dollar and to tax it. And so Trump's nomination for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors is an outspoken proponent of putting magnetic strips in physical cash so the government can track its movement and tax it. So in November 2017, not too long ago, the central banking proponent and Keynesian economist Marvin Goodfield was nominated by President Donald Trump to fill one of the vacancies of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. He was then confirmed by the U.S. Senate Banking Committee to advance. So what's interesting is that he is a proponent of these Orwellian concepts, and he's proposed and openly advocated for one of the most horrific plans of free society has ever seen, and that's tracking cash. So Good Friend's idea was to insert magnetic strips into the bills, like RFDI chips. So each time the cash was returned to a bank, the money would be taxed at a predetermined rate. This would discourage individuals from hoarding cash and remove one obstacle for central banks in setting these negative interest rates that we talked about in the beginning. Negative interest rates like Japan has, we practically have negative interest rates here. It's just above zero, right? Well, what if it went just below zero? For it to go just below zero, what would need to happen in America? America would have to be widely dependent on digital payments like Visa and MasterCard and and uh, bank to bank transfers. America would need to get rid of the $100 bill and or America would need to track all of the different uh, dollar bills and cash being used in society so people weren't hoarding cash and so people couldn't enact a run on the banks. And so this is just another piece of the puzzle that is giving the banks the power to charge people to hold their money in these private banks. So the article goes on to say that negative interest rates are employed to incentivize banks to lend money more freely and businesses and individuals to invest, lend, and spend money 
rather than pay a fee to keep that money safe, rather than pay a fee to, to save your money. They want the money to be in the economy. They want the money to be invested and they really don't want anyone to save their money. And they really want all the investment dollars inside the corporations that hold the stocks that they also own. It's a, it's a messed up, tangled web. And that's why we need more people out there to get open news, real news, to pay attention to the real information that's going around and not all the distractions. And then also to be paying attention to the financial technology on top of the news. We have all this FinTech news around Bitcoin, but then we have this other news that's really not related to financial technology or, or Bitcoin, and yet is going to affect everyone to a degree of magnitude like the world has never seen before. If uh, there was no cash or if all cash could be tracked, uh, this would be pretty Orwellian indeed. And so just to underscore how toxic of an idea this is, uh, the idea of a tax on cash is so politically toxic that Senators Rand Paul and Elizabeth Warren, two lawmakers often at opposite ends of the ideological spectrum, have denounced Goodfriend's idea and may now put his nomination in jeopardy. Very, very interesting that these senators that are on such opposites of the aisle of ideology, of topics that come up in the news all the time, are actually unifying together against this person and against the idea that this person is bringing because how severe of an idea this is and the position of power that this person would then have to enact his ideas. So let it be that you know it or not, the world is really led through the central banks. The central banks are the ones who define the monetary policy that the U.S. Treasury and the government goes along with. The central banks are the ones that define the interest rates, which then determines how much money is going to cost for other banks and for the businesses that want to take out loans, for people that want to take out loans. Uh, the central banks have a lot of power in the world with uh, around money and how money is involved in every aspect of the economy, including the military as well, right? And so it's interesting when we go over the coin desk and we see a Goldman Sachs executive say that central bank cryptos could be incredibly useful. And so this is a senior executive at Goldman Sachs and that she believes that those might one day be created by central banks. These cryptocurrencies might, might one day be created by central banks and that they could be incredibly useful. And so she goes on to say, is there room for a digital currency maybe sponsored by one of the major central banks like the Federal Reserve? Yes. Could it be incredibly useful? Could it reduce transaction costs? Yes. But not these ones that we currently have, the new ones that are going to be created by the central banks. And so this is a little foreshadowing of uh, what could happen. And in terms of impact, it may have some impact, but in terms of people's understanding, it's going to create huge amounts of confusion. And uh, central banks creating their own cryptocurrency is actually one of the ways that Bitcoin could be threatened. And uh, we're going to have a chart for you at the end of the show that's going to detail you, for you all of the different ways that cryptocurrency could be threatened along with the threat assessment level of these different tactics to destroy cryptocurrency. Central banks creating their own cryptocurrency and diluting brands of the major decentralized cryptocurrencies and pumping lots of money into these centralized central bank cryptos, you know, that's one of the threats that decentralized cryptocurrency is going to be facing. So when we saw the U.S. Senate hearing not too long ago, I think it was February 6th, we saw that the SEC chairman was relatively against decentralized technology and essentially said all tokens are... Uh, securities. All cryptocurrencies are securities, including Ethereum. Giovanni, the CFTC director, was a lot more bullish and has family members who are uh, purchasing Bitcoin. And he has stated that he believes that it's his responsibility, all of our collective responsibility to the next generation to uh, understand cryptocurrencies and to give cryptocurrencies a chance moving forward. And so what he's done is that uh, at the CFTC, is giving the employees the green light to trade cryptocurrencies. So I might have misspoke a second. It's actually Giancarlo, who's the chairman of the CFTC. And uh, a couple of the restrictions on this policy, however, is that the policy has a few different caveats. And so the CFTC employees may not trade cryptocurrencies on margin, nor may they take advantage of any insider information they acquire in the course of their work at the regulatory agency 
And additionally, CFTC employees are prohibited from investing in Bitcoin futures contracts because they fall under the purview of the regulatory agency of the CFTC itself. And so uh, while they're learning about cryptos, while there's questions if the people at the CFTC could invest in cryptocurrencies, they now have the green light to put their money into the space. And that's very interesting because the next layer of acceptance is entering into the regulatory space. The next layer of uh, adoption of money coming in is going to be entering the space as we see more and more banks, more and more regulators, more and more companies, more and more governments all coming around to accept cryptocurrency, recognizing the fact that the more of this that we have in our local communities, the more of this that we have in terms of awareness, understanding, and actual possession of these tokens, the stronger that our communities, the stronger that our companies, the stronger that our countries are going to be moving forward. To continue showing the progression of where we're going in the space, the Digital Currency Group, which has an investment stake in Coindesk.com, the website that's providing the article that we're reading from, Digital Currency Group has investments in lots of different companies, including Zcash and Coinbase and uh, the Ethereum Classic Investment Trust, Grayscale, XBTC, uh, Digital Currency Group is investing in a lot of things in the space. And as we know through previous videos, the Digital Currency Group is indirectly owned or has a ownership stake from NASDAQ, uh, the NASDAQ private market. And then through them, the NASDAQ exchange, the second largest exchange that we know about. So the Digital Currency Group has now invested in this Bitcoin friendly Silvergate bank. So the venture capital firm Digital Currency Group DCG has confirmed uh, this investment in Silvergate Capital Corporation, which is the holding company of the Bitcoin-friendly startup Silvergate Bank. And so the firm said Monday that it sold 9.5 million shares through a private placement, generating $114 million in total. And so these are funds that are going to be used to further support the bank's fintech deposits initiative and help them moving forward. It's also interesting to note that according to a previous Coindesk article that Silvergate Bank was supporting 15 different cryptocurrency startups as of May 2016. By Coindesk investing in a Silvergate and uh, the Silvergate Holdings Company, this also give, gives Coindesk access to these other 15 cryptocurrency startups and uh, we think it'd be really interesting to see exactly which of those startups uh, that they were in May 2016 and also to know which additional startups has Silvergate Bank supported since May 2016. So there's a lot moving in a lot of different directions and we are out here recognizing all this news, receiving all this news and just working really hard to share this news with you. We're out there sharing information on Twitter and we're out there sharing information on Facebook and uh, right here on YouTube if that's where you are watching this content. But what's important to know is that YouTube has come down really hard on us and YouTube has gone through great lengths to demonetize our station and demonetize other people's stations inside the cryptocurrency space, inside the independent news space on YouTube. There has been a huge effort to crack down on dissenting opinions or information that isn't very popular. And I can attest information about Bitcoin is not very popular at all. We don't know how long this is going to last and how far people are going to be able to get with sharing this information on YouTube and across these different platforms that are owned and controlled by these major companies in the technology and media industries. And so this is why we want to share with you, again, we talked about this before. I don't think we talk about it enough, but uh, we want you to, if you haven't already, to consider making yourself a Steemit account. And so this is our Steemit account over here at steemit.com slash at minting coins. And uh, I'm also on Steemit myself at Gary Palmer JR. I encourage you to make an account over on Steemit because when people share information on Steemit, this is a place where the information cannot be taken down. This is a place that is not being censored by mainstream media or technology companies which have a centralized control in and around and throughout our entire lives. And if uh, you want to get connected with people, connected with information, connected with stories and happenings in the world without the filter, without the censorship, then you can do that at Steemit. And at Steemit, 
you can be part of the pool of people who decide what's important. You can upvote what's important, and your vote can have real meaning. Your vote can have real power. And as we can see here, uh, your vote can also contribute to the creation of revenue for yourself and for the content creators in the space. If you haven't already made a Steam account, make a Steam account, check it out, explore it. It uses a cryptocurrency called Steam, and we think that Steam is going to be in a really important technology moving forward, a really important platform moving forward. Probably one of the uh, most successful, if not the most successful case of cryptocurrency outside of a store of value that we've seen anywhere. So as promised, we're not going to go into detail with this document right now, but these are the possible attacks on Bitcoin. We're going to keep this in the show notes for you. We have attacks to slow down the Bitcoin adoption, attacks to reduce the efficiency of the Bitcoin infrastructure, and then we have attacks to slow down the Bitcoin development. All of these are ranked by the possibility of such an attack in the next 10 years, and then the possible damage if the attack was successful. And then we have the probability times the damage to, to sort of give chances and destructive nature that people need to focus their attention on some of these issues and how they're going to counter the event of any of these situations unfolding. So take a peek at this in, uh, in the show notes and let me know what you think about this as well. That was a lot of information. There's a lot of cool things happening with Omizi Go, with Bitcoin, with Ethereum Classic, with Ethereum. There's a lot of talk and a lot of excitement about where we're moving forward. We see Goldman Sachs say bullish things about blockchain, never a good thing about Bitcoin. We see the Digital Currency Group making continued investments. We also saw Goldman Sachs through the, the company they invested in Circle, Circle purchase the crypto exchange Poloniex. So there's definitely moves being made in the background. But most importantly, outside of the world of cryptocurrency, what do you think about tracking chips being put into US dollars? Or maybe these tracking chips that they put into the US dollars can just be the physical representation of a Fed coin. Yeah, the future looks a little scary. The future looks a little weird. And uh, moving forward, we think that the future where people are going to have the most freedom is going to be the future that's based on open source technology, decentralized technology. And that's why it's more important than ever that as many people as you know learn about Bitcoin, have a Bitcoin wallet address, and then if you want to make that decision to own a little bit, now is your time to be able to make that decision because at some point it may be extremely difficult and uh, Bitcoin may be extremely rare and access to these systems may close up as you know, we don't know which direction regulation is going to move. So with that being said, share your thoughts in the comments below. Tap that like button. And until next time, I'm glad that together we are minting coins.